Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of What You Reading. People ask me all the time, Chuck, what are you reading when you're not writing? Uh, I guess uh, people want a perspective of a professional writer, I suppose, and I'm here to give it to you. So what have I been reading? I, I just finished this book. Uh, it's called Magic Hour by Jack Cardiff. And Jack Cardiff, if you've never heard of him, uh, is a, uh, you've certainly seen his work. He um, was a master cinematographer, a master cameraman, uh, and film director on you know, a lot of uh, really classic, um, classic films. He's a super, super talented guy. And um, it, it's his biography up to a certain point. It kind of gets up to uh, the early 60s and stops, unfortunately. Uh, Mr. Cardiff has passed. Uh, Jack Cardiff, he started out in a showbiz family. His parents were, you know, what would have in the United States have been uh, vaudeville performers. But in Britain, where he grew up, uh, they were music hall entertainers. And his dad was a comedian. His mother was a dancer and singer. And so, uh, and they moved into, uh, when they couldn't get work at the music halls, they moved into silent films. And uh, Mr. Cardiff actually appeared in a number of silent films as a child actor, even starred in one. And this is where his fascination with movie making began. And eventually he became a uh, camera assistant, a focus puller. And this was all before the silent era ended. And then he moved on to get you know, jobs in the sound era and eventually was, um, he was elevated to cinematographer director of photography, and he was the first uh, cameraman from the UK to be trained in the use of Technicolor. Uh, but just a, just an absolutely tremendous talent. Um, he credits a lot of his inspiration to classic paintings rather than photography. Uh, his claims were that he was never much of a technical photographer. He just knew it was right. Uh, if it looked right, it was right. And, and he would use paintings by Vermeer and Turner and think, uh, for his inspiration on how to light scenes. And the stuff is indelible. Uh, you'll probably recognize some of his work as, as, as I describe more of it. But he tells some awesome stories. Uh, you know, working with Marlena Dietrich, who apparently knew a whole lot about film lighting because she wanted to appear uh, in her best light, literally, on film. And she would advise the lighting people and the cinematographer, Jack Cardiff included, on how to light her. And Cardiff said it was amazing. She, her, her instincts were dead on all the time. And he told all of the camera assistants and lighting people, you know, listen to her. She knows what she's talking about. So Cardiff, not a man all wrapped up in ego. He just wanted to get the best pictures he could on film. He tells a very, very funny story about Marlene Dietrich in this scene in particular where she shows up for a scene where she's supposed to be in a bubble bath and she arrives uh, nude instead of wearing a one-piece bathing suit, which was normal. And uh, that's, that's, that's quite a story, he tells. And apparently by the end of that shoot, the soundstage was just full of people uh, who didn't necessarily have to be there. <laughs> Because they had to do several, several takes, each one requiring Ms. Dietrich to get out of the tub while they frothed up the bubbles once more. Uh, <laughs> uh, I tell some terrific stories about Alfred Hitchcock, particularly this, uh, what sounded like a nearly impossible shoot on a movie called Under Capricorn, which is an Alfred, Alfred Hitchcock movie I have never seen, uh, but I'm going to correct that very soon because I'm dying to see the end results of what Cardiff described as just a nightmare shoot. <laughs> just trying with Hitchcock coming up with some of his craziest ideas for how to um, make the camera a character in the film. Uh, Hitchcock was all about, you know, the camera being the eye of the audience. And uh, he perhaps went a little too far on Under Capricorn. So I'm really, I'm really anxious to read about it. Uh, he goes on for an entire chapter <clears throat> about shooting the African Queen and you know, how the entire cast was almost killed 
by either drowning wild animals, uh, venomous lizards, or, or illness. And uh, one of the funny parts was he reveals that the only persons in the crew and cast that did not get sick, I mean, really, really sick, with malaria and fevers and all kinds of things, were director John Huston and uh, Humphrey Bogart. And the reason for that is that neither John Huston nor Humphrey Bogart drank any water <laughs> during the shoot of African Queen. They drank only liquor. <laughs> so, so they were drunk all the time, but um, but feeling okay in, in more ways than one. Uh, it sounds like a harrowing, absolutely harrowing, nightmarish uh, shoot on this movie. Um, he talks about in a chapter, just a tragic story. If you're a creator, it's, it's just heartbreaking. Uh, he was he was making a movie of William Tell with Errol Flynn. And if you go, wait a minute, Chuck, I never saw a William Tell movie with Errol Flynn. No, you didn't, because they didn't get to complete it. Uh, Flynn put a half a million dollars of his own money into this movie, along with an Italian investor who turned out not to have any money at all. <laughs> and half a million dollars back in the mid-50s, that, you're talking serious bread. So uh, Flynn basically went broke making this movie, and they built all these fantastic sets uh, in the Italian Alps, uh, which apparently are still there to this day. Uh, they actually built some buildings, actually built them from stone. Um, and they shot quite a bit of the movie. Uh, Cardiff insists that the movie looked fantastic. And uh, they almost hired Sophia Loren as the fa male, female lead, but Flynn, Flynn didn't, she, uh, she didn't impress Flynn. <laughs> She was not Sophia Loren yet. She was Sophia Lazara. She had not changed her name and become a big star yet. But um, Flynn just, uh, nah, I'm going to pass on her. She doesn't She doesn't speak to me. <laughs> probably probably Sophia was a little too old for him at, at 19. Uh, so, and, and speaking of Flynn, he tells a number of stories about Errol Flynn that I'm not going to tell you here. They are not safe for work anywhere. Uh, just, uh, Flynn was just a super charming guy with no moral compass, slowly drinking himself to death. Um, the Flynn stories are funny, but sad because this guy just, he burnt the candle at every end it had. So, uh, it's just amazing stuff. He also talks about being, um, the, uh, some great stories about being the, director of photography on the Vikings, the Kirk Douglas, Tony Curtis uh, spectacle about uh, Norsemen uh, made in the early 60s. And um, man, including, I mean, even to this day with all the CGI and IMAX and all this other crap, the climactic sword fight in the Vikings is still vertigo inducing. It's just amazing footage uh, of, of Douglas and uh, um, Curtis going at it atop a cathedral. Uh, but anyway, um, Cardiff tells these great stories, uh, one of which is that Kirk Douglas couldn't get this movie made because all of the studios wanted him to have another big star in the movie, not just him, because it was too big a budget for just one star to carry. And so no one wanted to be in it with him. And he finally talked to Tony Curtis, and Curtis said, well, I'll be in it if I can play the lead. <laughs> he wanted Kirk Douglas's part. And Kirk was so anxious to get this movie made, he agreed to it. And Kirk took the uh, role as, you know, the bad guy, the bad Viking. And um, what Curtis didn't realize was that behind the scenes, uh, Douglas was expanding his role as the bad guy. <laughs> so that by the time the film was completed, Kirk Douglas was the lead, uh, not Tony Curtis, which apparently pissed Curtis off. Uh, another really funny story is if you've seen the movie, unforgettable scene of Ernest Borgnine being, he's, he's captive, he's Viking chief, and he's being forced to jump into a pit full of um, um, either rabid dogs or wolves. Um, and basically they're executing him. And um, they couldn't get the dogs riled up. They kept you know, doing everything, poking at them. They, they did some really cruel things to these dogs to try to get them riled up, and, and they wouldn't. They would just sort of lay down and 
and look into the camera, you know, with doleful eyes, um, you know, cue the Sarah McLachlan music. And um, it wasn't until Tony Curtis showed up on set. <clears throat> Tony Curtis wasn't shooting. He wasn't supposed to be on set that day, even though he's in the scene. He wasn't supposed to be on set on the day that Borgnine jumps into the pit. And um, the <laughs> Curtis... Uh, showed up on set and he and he was wearing a disguise because he, he blended in with the extras. He put on some silly hat and some, you know, crazy clothes and he was hanging around as an extra just because just he wanted to see the scene being shot. And at one point, while they were trying to figure out how to get these dogs riled up, Curtis goes to the edge of the pit and looks down at them. And for some reason, when the dogs saw Tony Curtis, they went nuts they just went, they didn't like him for some reason and they went crazy. And so he had to stay on the set for the rest of the day to keep the dogs riled up. <laughs> the, the things you got to do to get a movie made. Um, Cardiff went on to direct. I mean, he directed, you know, a lot of uh, well-received uh, uh, award-winning films, you know, like Sons and Lovers and things like that. But, you know, th those are more artsy adult drama kind of i'm a genre guy I'm, I'm i'm a big kid i'll never grow up uh he directed his own viking epic the long ships a movie i absolutely adored when i was a kid and um dark of the sun uh one of the greatest african mercenary movies ever made uh second only to dogs of war which cardiff was uh director of cinematography on and this one stunned me uh, when I looked up more about Cardiff. I had forgotten he was the director of photography on Rambo 2. So this guy's film career stretched from the earliest days of the silent era all the way up to direct and Sly in Rambo 2. That's, that's pretty freaking amazing. But it's a great book. Uh, he's a very, very good writer. I mean, this is obviously not ghostwritten. You can tell when a book's been ghostwritten because it's full of cliches and, and too clever writing. Um, this Cardiff wrote himself. He's a very good writer, um, a, a self-educated man. Uh, and, he, you know, his, his word usage and, and as a raconteur, as a storyteller, he, he's just entertaining. Uh, even when there were things in there, the only chapter I didn't like was the one about Marilyn Monroe, because Marilyn Monroe just doesn't interest me for some reason. I know... And even Cardiff acknowledges this. When you know too much about Marilyn Monroe's biography, it, it takes a lot of the luster off. So if you're if you're like a big fan of Marilyn Monroe and you idolize Marilyn Monroe, don't 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 read too much about her early life. Uh, anyway, I got a what you're reading extra. One more book. Okay, so I'm uh, hanging around the used bookstore looking for gold medal westerns, largely. Uh, it's the only section I look in is the western section. And I find this western by Eric Red. And I didn't know Eric Red writes novels. Now, if you don't know who Eric Red is, uh, Eric Red was a pretty white hot screenwriter in the 80s and early 90s, um, writing, you know. Um, action movies for the most part, but they were action movies that were thoughtful, something on their mind. It was a little more depth than usual uh, in their action films. I mean, Near Dark, The Hitcher, Cohen and Tate, Blue Steel. Uh, these were not your typical 80s action fare. And I thought, well, geez, he, he, he wrote a Western. I, I, I got to read this. And... Um, so I started it, <laughs> I got about 30 pages in, and it's like, no, nah, I don't think so. And apparently he's written a bunch of them. Uh, it's part of a series called Joe Noose. The lead character is a bounty hunter called Joe Noose, like in Hangman's Noose. Has to be the most unimaginatively named Western character since Atlas Comics' old Western Kid series. <laughs> and... I'm reading it, and it's had an interesting premise. Cattle drive across Wyoming, and someone in the uh, crew of drovers is a, is a murderer. And he's killing off drovers. Um, I guess the idea is that he's working for a competing cattle outfit to prevent this cattle from getting to market on time or at all. 
And so you've got this sort of Agatha Christie mystery within the Western. I'm like, okay, all right, that's interesting enough. And then I get to the second chapter, and we meet the trail boss, and it's a woman. Right? And I'm like, uh, I never heard of that. <laughs> a woman trail boss? A woman out on the middle of nowhere for months at a time with like 3,000 head of cattle and, and a dozen guys? Um, how's this going to work? And then they get the description, and, and, and the description makes it sound like Kim Basinger, right? Uh, I was like, and I'm thinking before, the, before he describes the character, I'm like, well, if she looks like Marjorie Maine, I'm okay with it. <laughs> she's like, this, you know, she's got this long blonde hair and shapely figure, and it's like, okay, come, come on, come on, give me a break. And it's like, well, okay, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll bite the bullet here and keep reading. And then, I, and then Joe Noose shows up, with um, another person who's a U.S. Marshal who's also female. <laughs> That's when I had to stop reading. A U.S. Marshal in the 1880s in Wyoming who's a woman. Give me a break. I thought it's, it's not going to get any better from here. So I, I just stopped reading. Sorry, Mr. Red. I love your movies from the 80s. But uh, I, I, I couldn't handle this one. Anyway, that's what I've been reading. So thanks for watching, thanks for listening, and I'll see you down the road.